So in this last little segment that I'm going to do, um, some songs and testimony, um, I want to share with you a dream I would never have dreamed. I would not have chosen to dream. But it was a dream that God birthed in my heart, and he brought me to a place where I was unwrapped enough from my wounds and my fears and my pains to begin to see something beautiful like I had never seen before in some place unexpected. Probably about six or seven years ago, a friend of mine, also a Jewish believer, um, was uh, invited by some friends who she had ministered to in the States to come to Germany and um, pray and minister and teach in Germany. And um, she was telling me about the process, you know. And uh, I'd grown up, like she'd grown up, with the understanding that Jews don't go to Germany, you know? And uh, so she was telling me, you know, how her young, charismatic, evangelical German Christian hosts, you know, were communicating with her. And she happened to have this dream that she felt the Lord had given her prior to going. And the dream was, that um, in the dream she was supposed to go and visit one of the former concentration campsites. And uh, she told her nice young German hosts, and they were um, extremely offended. Offended at the idea that she had to go and see one of those um, campsites. And uh, they told her so. And uh, she said, you know, very kindly and gently, she said, you know, it's in a matter of an obedience to God, and so if you can't go with me, I'll find a way to go by myself, you know. But as she was, uh, as she was telling me this, as she was relating this story to me, I got very offended that they were offended. Uh, offense runs deep in my family. So I was very offended, you know. And uh, it was the Sunday before she was going, and I, I said, well, I really need to pray for you. You know, you're going into enemy territory. What a terrible thing. And, you know, and I, I, I was very full, very, very full, not of the Ruach HaKodesh. <laughs> but I was full. And I put my hand on her, and I began to pray for her, you know. And I can't even tell you what I said. And then, as I was praying, this little whisper come into my heart, you know? And the whisper was, what do you think happened to the Germans after the war? And I'm like, who cares? Who cares? Why would I care? What do I care what happened to the Germans after the war, you know? And then, this other whisper comes. How do you think the Germans feel about the Holocaust? How could I know what they feel? Or why would I care what they feel? And you know, these whispers, they kind of went on for the next few weeks and months. And pretty soon, you know, I'm a little slow. Pretty soon I got the idea that the way I viewed the situation in Germany was not the way that God viewed the situation in Germany. The way I felt about Germany was not the way God felt about Germany. And I went to Germany for the first time in 2007 because I felt he was speaking to me about something he wanted to do. And um, I went with a friend of mine who was more than reluctant, also a Jewish believer. And um, 
We were hosted by uh, Jews for Jesus and also Chosen People Ministries. And um, did some concerts and while I was there. But I went to some of the camps. My friend and I did. And we went to Bergen-Belsen, the first camp we went to. And Bergen-Belsen was the place where Anne Frank died. And Bergen-Belsen is this uh, place that's cut out of the forest. Um, and um, it has these large stones um, in different parts of the uh, area. And there's one part where it's like an oval track of these large stones spaced apart. And there are memorial stones of how many people were buried there. Each one says uh, like 2,500 tote or 2,000 tote or, you know. And there amid the stones are these pink flowers growing uh, carelessly, recklessly, without any respect for where they are. And I was offended. I was offended at the flowers. Like, what are they doing here? Should be Sodom and Gomorrah, you know? And, and I'm looking at these beautiful little pink flowers growing everywhere, little pink flowers. And I was just like really angry inside. And I hear the Lord say in my heart, you know, I'm a redeemer. How about you? I'm about life. How about you? I, uh, I went again in 2008, and um, I uh, was part of a conference and part of a campaign that Jews for Jesus was doing in Warsaw. And, um, I went to um, Birkenau, Auschwitz-Birkenau, and I remember standing in Auschwitz-Birkenau, and I heard this, this terrible place. Auschwitz-Birkenau is the largest death camp of the war. You know, over a million, a million and a half, uh, mostly Jewish people were killed in Auschwitz-Birkenau. And I remember standing there in the, uh, in the grounds, you know, vast place, you know. And I hear the Lord in my soul say one word, you know, a word that just blew my mind. You know, I'm looking at this place and how horrible and, you know, everything it stands for. And I hear the Lord say in my heart, you know, this one word, and it is kadosh, holy, like this place, this place, kadosh, holy, because of the blood of the people who are in this place and because of the blood of my son for the people in this place. There are no stains in the earth that are deeper than the stains of Yeshua and his blood and the power of that blood to heal and redeem and bring beauty out of ashes. And as I walked around in Birkenau, you know, I felt like the Lord was saying, um, I was there. I am here. I was there and I will be here. And sometimes, you know, in our lives, something happens that's so horrific, we forget that God has promised to never leave us or forsake us. Amen. And we think it's only for this particular time, you know. We came to know the Lord, and so it was this time. And yet his word is, I will never leave you or forsake you. And even in the times before we knew him, as we turned them over to him, we can find his footprints in those times. I remember um, being in Birkenau. Well, no, I remember being actually in Nuremberg also, you know, and was having communion. There were a group of us having communion. Germans and Poles together and, and Jews. And we were in Zeppelin Field, this vast uh, kind of like arena, a huge place where Hitler marched his armies and said these horrible things and the race laws. And, and the communion cup came last to me. 
And I felt like the Lord um, impressed on my heart to pour it out after I took a sip. And then he said, my blood is enough. And there are places in our hearts, in our lives, where we think that maybe Yeshua doesn't see us there. Maybe he missed that before we came to him. Maybe he just wasn't really there. I mean, yeah, he's there, he knows everything, but you know, the intimacy, the closeness, maybe he stood at a distance because that thing was just too big or too horrible or too awful. And it's such a wound that we just don't even know how to climb out of. And he says, he says, I was there, and he says, my blood is enough. This is a song um, Michael and I wrote many, many years ago. And I just want to invite you to let the Holy Spirit speak to you. In those places in your heart where It's hard for you to imagine that God saw you and held you and walked you through and it was still hard and difficult and painful and scarring and yet he was there. Where was I when love was 
was lost and you thought it wasn't fair. Where was I when sin crept in and caught you in its snare? When the evil swept right through you and you fell. Roses, long stem, beautiful red roses in places like Dachau and Bergen and Auschwitz in the towns to the people in those towns who live in shame and condemnation and, and yes, denial, some of them as well, but many of them in shame, stuck in a place of unforgiveness with no closure. And we handed out these roses, and each one had a card attached. Um, I have those cards on my table, and, and they were written in the language of the country we were in. And they said, a rose of remembrance, red for the blood of the people who died, red for the Savior's blood, which was shed for your people and mine, and red for his love. which makes love between us possible. And I can't tell you all the hugs and kisses and tears and thankfulness and wonder and amazement and you couldn't possibly be giving this rose to me. Uh, in June, we handed out 4,000 roses um, in the Warsaw Ghetto area. And then in each place that we were, um, we did concerts, I did concerts, and people surrendered their hearts to Yeshua. So grateful for kindness, that kindness that leads to repentance. And we worshiped, we worshiped in Treblinka, 
and we interceded for the healing of the land and for the people and for our people. In Birkenau, in Bergen-Belsen, in Dachau, in a little town called Yedvabne. And you know, he wants to make us all displays of his splendor. He wants to make us all the hands and feet and mouths and faces of his great and enduring love. And we can't do it if we're still doing this, protecting ourselves, pushing people away, living in the scar, living in the wound. We can't even see the people who are wounded because we're so consumed with our own wounds. And so as I sing this song, this last song, I know most of you probably know it. But I, I want to invite you to, I want to give you an opportunity to lay down your judgment, your self-protective devices, <laughs> your prejudice, your fear, your own names for yourself, the things that hinder you from being the fullness of God's love in this earth. Lay them down, man. I want to invite you to get up out of your seat and just come and stand and give them to him. We are bodies, you know, by the way. I know we're souls, but he has put our souls in bodies. Present yourself as an offering to him. You don't need me to pray for you. You don't need anyone to pray for you. You just need to confess and say, here it is, Lord. I want you to take it from me. I want to be filled again with your love, that there's no corner in my being where your blood is not enough. Your blood is enough for every piece of my life.